Okay. Oh, is it recording now? Uh, yes. All right. So, hello, everybody. I'm Paul Levy from Birmingham, from the University of Birmingham. Um, and thanks for inviting me to this uh, seminar. Um, and uh, I'm. What am I going to talk? Well, oh, hang on. Let's get the, to get the mouse to get the controls working. I've got to click again. Right. Okay. So here's um, an outline of the talk. So I'm going to start with a short introduction, and then I'm going to give some general background, much of which, if not all, will be familiar to you already. I should say I gave this same talk yesterday to a computer science, logic, and semantics audience, which is quite different so um what what is, i may have ended up making a talk which is unsuitable for both audiences because i couldn't write two different <laughs> talks so anyway i hope it works um then i'll i'll, I'll try and make my sales pitch uh, explain what broad infinity is and uh, why you should believe in it i think or well, that's up to you and um and then i'll talk about the generation principles and then someone near the end of the talk i'll talk about ordinals which is quite radical, I think, because for set theory culture, people tend to reduce everything to questions about ordinals. But, but um, don't get me wrong, I love ordinals, but I, I think it's um, I, I'm going to downplay them in this talk. It's not really what the focus is on. And then I'll wrap up um, with some conclusions. So, here, so, OK. So the axiom of infinity is a well-known part of set theory, which expresses an intuition, which is the set of natural numbers. Um, and the point of this talk is to give a new axiom scheme called broad infinity, which is not provable in ZFC, assuming ZFC is consistent, which it is. Um, and it expresses a similar kind of intuition, which I'll call the set of broad numbers or G broad numbers for a certain G, which I'll explain. Um, how strong is that intuition? Well, I think it's strong, but I obviously can't tell you what to think. So uh, only you could judge whether you think this is a convincing axiom scheme. Right. Um, so let's give you some background. OK, ZFC, you may have heard of it. It's a set theory that includes the axiom of choice. And it includes, well, it assumes implicitly that everything is a set, and it also assumes that membership is well founded. And there are some small variations. Well, whether they're small or not depends on your perspective, but there are some variations um, like ZFC A, A for atoms, which allows R elements, ZFC N, N for non well founded, which drops the axiom of foundation, or ZFC A N, which allows both of them. For the purposes of this talk, any of them will do, right? It's, it's not an important. The distinction so whichever one you prefer really um for other purposes the distance might matter but not today uh and then we have the same theories but without the axiom of choice um these are classical theories using classical logic and then moving along the direction once we stop dropping the axiom of choice the next step is to drop excluded middle so there are two well-known theories that uh, uh that do that, CZF and IZF. Um, both these are theories that don't have excluded middle. They also don't have axiom of choice, which implies excluded middle. So you tend to think of excluded middle as like a weak form of axiom of choice. Um, the, main, there are may, the main difference between these two theories uh, is that IZF truth values, which means subsets of one, uh, form a set, and that then gives you power sets. Whereas in CZF, you don't assume that. So truth values are just a class, but they don't necessarily form a set. That, that's not the only difference, but that's the main difference, I would say, between IZF and CZF. So these are two kind of communities that study these theories. Um, so that's kind of proceeding beyond non-acceptance of choices to not accept excluded. Uh, Paul, I mean, do you, you mean that just in a, a heuristic sense or in a, a precise formalized sense? I'm just trying to picture, like, is there a definition of what a truth value would a be. A truth value, okay, if you, it'll do, it, let's say- You're talking about value is a, of, a, of a singleton or something? Is yeah, that, a sub, exactly, that? a subset of one. Okay. Defi define truth value to be subset of one, okay. okay? In IZF, you can prove that's a set, or you can take that as an axiom. In right. CZF, you can't prove that, that's a, that they right. form a set. Okay. And because CZF does have exponentiation, right? You can form the set of functions. From yeah, right. Some of the exponentiation is tamer. Yeah. 
that uh, no exponentiation is a single axiom in CZ def. Um, that together with truth value set, a pa I mean, put it this way, power set axiom is uh, equivalent to the combination of truth value set and exponentiation. So people in like classical set theory, when they think about not accepting power set, they are really thinking about not accepting exponentiation because truth value set is automatic in classical logic because you've got only two truth values, right? But um, but for people who are not assuming it's through the middle, there's two parts of the power set axiom. Right. There's exponentiation and there's truth value set. So they're accepting exponentiation, but the question that the main thing that divides these two communities is, is whether they accept. I mean, you could say, you know, once you doubt that there are only two truth values, why would you accept that they are even set many? You know, they could be proper class many. I mean, you know. I mean, there's probably some good story about why exponentiation is, is you know, quote, more acceptable than, yeah. Uh, yeah. but I'm distracting you. No, okay, yeah, now, is. I mean, it's about that mathematical issue and now I'm aware of what, yeah. Right, right. It's, it's not the only difference between these two schools, but I would say it's the main difference. Um, I mean, um, uh, could I just uh, follow up on something? Sure. Uh, uh, it's a little confusing to me, at least, uh, to to view these uh, different theories that you wrote down here as kind of forming a hierarchy. Because, I mean, what you mentioned first are all theories theories of classical logic. While yes. uh, dropping the excluded middle means you're totally leaving the realm of classical logic. Mm -hmm. So it's it's like a the, you're you're changing the underlying logic rather than yeah. just the set of axioms. That's true. Um, yeah, I mean, I tend to, yeah, I tend not, to, okay, that's, it's a point of view, if you think of set theory as sort of these two levels, logic first, and then the theory on top, then, yeah, uh, I mean, I mean, I personally, I'm, yeah, I mean, I really belong to the ZFC school, I mean, in the sense that, well, certainly I'm, I'm very happy with the axiom of choice, but I think these weaker systems are interesting too. Um, I, I do think of, dropping it through the middle as a, as a sort of a step in a, I, I do think of these as being in a hierarchy, but it's, I mean, you're just saying that, uh, I mean, okay, I guess you can, you can, if you call excluded middle uh, an axiom or axiom scheme, you can also, you can express it as a single axiom, which is there are just two truth values. Um, then, um, yeah, you can see, it, I mean, there is this thing, you know, Giaconescu's theorem, the axiom of choice implies excluded middle in that is over one of these weak theories, or certainly over IZF. Given IZF, axiom of choice implies excluded middle. So people in these communities tend to think of excluded middle as being a weak form of axiom of choice. Um, but if you're used to classical logic, if that's um, obviously, I mean, yeah. Anyway, that these things are, in, these theories are included and you're quite right to say that the two on the right are classical and the two on the left are not. Right. Um, I guess, you know, to me, it's just, uh, I mean, some of what you said doesn't really make sense to me because I'm only used to classical logic. So for example, talking about uh, whether or not the truth values form a set, I mean, the truth values to me are something that's external to the theory that's that's in the background somehow, you know? Mm -hmm. So- uh, that's, why, that's why I was asking my question, but he makes, what he means by it is something internal. Right, so that means somehow part of the logic is internal to the theory. I don't um, know. That's, uh, <laughs> well, it's a different logic. I mean, in they CZF and IZF use intuitionistic logic, right? That's a, a form of logic which does not assume excluded middle, which does not, in fact, in intuition, I would say negation is not a primitive connective. You may use not, hang on, you may use, define uh, not phi to be... Implies false. Implies false. That's just an abbreviation, but you definitely don't think of negation as a primitive. And I th uh, and um, the law of it through the middle is not provable in this logic. So it's just a different logic. Well, I say it's just obviously. I mean that classical logic is sim the models of classical logic are simpler than the models of intuitionistic logic. Um, and. Um, yeah, I guess if I can make my question just concrete. Uh, so, okay, okay. Uh, I mean, you know, in classical logic, uh, the yeah. truth value is something that uh, is assigned to a formula and an assignment and a model, right? So once you have right. fixed the model and the formula yeah. and the assignment of the free variables, yeah. you can assign to it a 
truth value and this truth value is outside the model that's that's uh, you know so to speak zero or one or true or yeah. false or whatever yeah. and the values true or false are not elements of the model in any way right. so so somehow yeah. i guess this must work very differently when you talk about whether or not the truth values form a set well actually... may i make a suggestion i think i mean you can tell me if this is correct or not but i'm getting my intuition from from topos is right i think what you mean by truth values Right, you might flesh it out with the phrase characteristic functions. Yeah, I, I mean, I the think- The values a characteristic function might take. Um, I mean, if you have a proposition and then you, you sort of test the elements of, a, of an ambient set, right? And you want to say yes or no, you want to talk about the subset that you cut out, right? And then you could phrase this in terms of how many truth values you have. So maybe is that what you mean here? Okay, hang on, hang on. Okay, maybe I could say a little bit more, but I think, I don't want to spend too long on this because I'm, I kind of deliberate. I mean, I'm choosing th to give these theories, to, to to give this talk in terms of these theories, mainly because they are kind of well-known theories. So, I, I, I mean, so that, but uh, but anyway, so one can. For example, piano arithmetic is a classical theory, right? It has there's an intuitionistic version which is called Heiting arithmetic. Um, that's the same, essentially the same theory, but using intuitionistic logic rather than classical logic. In Heiting arithmetic and, and piano arithmetic, you don't talk about truth values. Truth values are not internal things as they happen to in, as they are in set theory. In because we're talking because these theories here are set theories, there's a there's a different relationship between um, between the um, Bet bet the, prop the, the law of excluded middle, which is you know, phi or not phi, and things in the logic. Now, how can I put this? I, I'm, I simplified things a bit when I so to be precise, there's an axiom of Boolean truth in these systems. That's how I would call it. Doesn't, I don't know any other name for it, which is that every truth value is either true or false, right? Now, um, is either basically zero or one, let's say. Imagine that truth value means subset of one. That's good enough, right? Now, for IZF, this scheme of the excluded middle is a equivalent to the axiom of Boolean of truth. For CZF, um, this excluded middle implies the axiom of Boolean truth, but it's not, not, they're not actually equivalent. So things are a little bit more complicated than what I suggested. Um, but... Um, I think I would prefer not to really go into this too much. I mean, I understand that some, okay, some people here are completely unfamiliar with intuitionistic theories. That's fine. I'm kind of trying to present this work to four different communities at the same time, which might be like this community, this community, this community, and this community. And people in the set theory world are very familiar with the idea of set theory without choice, maybe not so familiar with the idea of set theory without excluded middle, which is, is fine. Um, I hope that people in all four schools can get something out of this. And mainly, I'm talking about the classical part. So, it, but um, if that helps, I actually have, oh, now, okay, I'm gonna, there's more to say on this slide. So first of all, I have to make some warnings that the literature is very, is a bit confusing because people are using these kinds of words in lots of different ways. So you just to be aware of this. And the final thing I want to say on this subject is that you, if you're working on the left in these two theories, you have to be careful with ordinals because a lot of the things you thought you knew about ordinals are not valid in these theories. So for example, it's not true that the class of ordinals, so it's not provable that the class of ordinals is linearly ordered. Um, it's not provable that every ordinal is either zero or successor or limit. And it's not provable that any inhabited set of ordinals has a least element. So generally speaking, for people who work in these communities, ordinals play a less central role than they do for people who work in these communities. But that doesn't mean that they not, don't play any role at all, because they do. Uh, is just, it, is uh, it this, would it be the same or different provi uh, things to worry about for well-ordered sets? Yeah, I've it's just the been, same. I've it's just the been same. doing, I mean, I've been thinking about excluded yeah. middle as I've been writing my lecture Correct. notes. The right, the, so. Yeah, you have the... the Definition, people define well ordering very carefully in this world to be a extensional, um, well-founded 
I think that's the extension of well found. Every non empty set should be, should have, every inhabited set should have a least element or every non. No, guess, no, probably. nothing like that. It's just no. got to be well, well founded and uh, extensional. And linearly ordered. And transitive. Oh, you... No, not linearly ordered. Transitive, no. extent. If you assume transitive and well founded, then classically extensional and linearly ordered are equivalent. That's a non trivial fact. But Intuitionistically, that's no longer true, and the one that gives right. a uh, yeah, theory a is extensionality. Fact, exactly. So you have you go for extensionality. So only some some well-ordered sets are linear and some are not. Some ordinals are linear and some are not. If you restrict to the linear ordinals, everything goes haywire. You definitely don't want to do that. But um, this, this is all. It's really all a bit of a background. I mean, I see that it's good that you're right. Please do keep asking the questions. But I do. Um, let me make a comment about well-founded. Uh, okay. uh, in the intro, if we don't have the law of the excluded middle, you almost truly do not want to say that inhabited sets have small, have minimal elements, because if you do that, the natural numbers are not going to be well ordered by the standard ordering, and the, the mm -hmm. way to define well well ordered or well founded mm -hmm. is as an induction principle, which looks mm -hmm. equivalent classically, but yeah. that's yeah. not intuitionistically. Yes. Yeah, so, so generally speaking, the further as you move to the right along this spectrum, things more and more things become equivalent. For example, in ZFC, you know, you've only got one notion of finiteness. In ZF, you have, I think, more than one notion of finiteness. I'm not sure. About, and then you, as you go left, you get a proliferation of different notions. You know, things that are equivalent on the right become inequivalent as you move to the left. So you, everything becomes more sensitive. Um, the, I should say the main purpose of this talk really is the, Z, the ZFC world. I mean, this is where I live, but I'm interested in these world, these communities going to the left, and I'm trying to engage in some differential marketing because I want to sell broad infinity to all of these different communities. Um, let, I, you'll, hopefully, you'll see some more as I go along about why why I'm why I'm interested in going down going to the left as well as sticking to ZFC. Maybe that will become clearer, okay? So I'm gonna move on. Uh, the last part of, uh, so I've got some more background. Okay, this is all very familiar, I'm sure to you. Um, set theorists often talk about classes, which can be sets or proper, can be sets or proper classes. An example of a proper class is ORD, so a class of ordinals. Um, but we're using the language of ZFC, therefore the only classes we can speak about are the ones given by formulas with parameters. Uh, that doesn't mean that other classes don't exist, but we simply can't speak about them. Um, and the same goes if you want to talk about functions on a class C or a class dependent on an element of another class. All of these things would be given by formulas with parameters. And when you have a statement that quantifies over classes, you express that as a scheme. And when you say that a class exists, that usually means that you're, you have to construct it, right? So that's just a standard ZFC thing. And also I should say, Everything I'm going to say remains true if you allow extra predicate and function symbols in the theory. Okay, uh, so that adds some extra generality to all of my meta theorems. Um, right. Okay. Uh, so here are a couple of set theoretic axioms that are in the literature. So um, as I'm sure you all know, a regular ordinal is one that can't be expressed as a supreme number. This, well, this is a statement of smaller ordinals. Uh, I'm often I'm going to express things very classically. Some of these statements would not be true in the intuitionistic statement. Anyway, so, um, so Blass's axiom. Uh, well, I, I know about it from a paper of Andreas Blass, who is here, so that's great. Um, says uh, is that the class of regular ordinals is unbounded. Uh, and we know from Gittick that this is not provable in ZF under a consistency hypothesis, um, but it, it clearly is provable in ZFC. So the thing I've written in blue is not a mathematical statement. It's more a kind of um, opinion, right? Um, Blass's axiom is a little bit choicy. Okay, so this is my opinion. You might disagree with this, but uh, anyway. Let's move on to another set theoretic principle, which you're probably familiar with. That is the Ordis Marlowe scheme. It has appeared under different names in the literature. Uh, but this name seems to have become popular recently, and it's quite a good name. 
This says that every closed unbounded class of ordinals contains a regular ordinal. It can't be proved in ZFC if ZFC is consistent, which it is. Um, and pretty obviously, it implies Blass's axiom. So I would say, and again, this is just an opinion, that Ordis Marlowe, likewise, is a little bit choicy. Now, this new axiom scheme that I'm going to introduce today, which I haven't told you about, broad infinity, uh, is actually equivalent to Ordis Marlowe if we assume axiom of choice. Um, and I guess that it does, that you, I, this is a conjecture, but I don't know. Um, it seems reasonable to me that it, I, I can't see why it would imply Blass's axiom. So the way I think, one way that I like to think about broad infinity is that it's kind of disentangling the choice aspect of Ordis Marlowe um, and so that we then end up, so you kind of taking away the choice so that we have two completely separate intuitions. This intuition that drives the axiom of choice, which I, is an intuition that I accept, I think it's a very powerful intuition, but it's a completely separate intuition about broad infinity that works even in a setting where you don't assume choice or don't assume excluded middle. Even though I'm, I'm happy with the axiom of choice, I'm not doing this because I don't like the axiom of choice, I do, but I think it's when you kind of set out basic axioms of set theory, you kind of want to separate the different basic intuitions. So you want to distill the kind of that part of the Ordis Marlowe that doesn't, isn't about choice. So again, this is, this thing in blue is an opinion. It's not a, not a theorem in any, count. it can't be, but that's how I think about this, okay? And the um, line of the slide, where you, wrote equivalent, where you wrote that these axioms are equivalent, uh, do you mean equiconsistent? No, I mean equivalent. They're axioms, first of all, they're axiom schemes. Each axiom scheme implies the other. And remember, that means, remember, we're allowed to have extra predicate and function symbols yeah. around. Okay. So how? I haven't told you what broad infinity actually is yet. Yeah. So well, confused tell you very much, but I'll give you advance, advance notice that when, when I say this axiom scheme is new, right? From us, obviously, you could say, well, if you, you could say, well, if you're happy with, if you accept choice, you might say, well, it's not new. It's just a new way of writing and not something old, which, which is a, a point of view, right? Um, but it certainly looks very different. Well, I think it does anyway. Maybe you disagree. Okay, so that's all the background finished, right? Um, I'm, yeah, I'm definitely happy for people to keep, well, Okay, I am, but then I fear that, that, I'm, that we're going to run out of time. I don't, I, I don't know. I'll leave that up to the chair to worry about. From my point of view, I can carry on presenting and discussing quite happily. Um, so, uh, now as, in order to introduce broad infinity, what I'm going to do is go through four principles, going from kind of the weakest to the strongest, um, to kind of build up some ideas, right? And then, so... Axiom of infinity, I mean, you've all seen, other, well, there are lots of different ways of presenting the axiom of infinity. I know that Adam has, knows a lot about different versions. This is my preferred version. You might disagree. It's certainly convenient. So let, I'm going to write T for the class of all things, which may or may not be the class of all sets, depending, uh, depending on whether you want to allow R elements. Um, I'll call that T. So the first step, so I'm going to define this, Present the axiom of infinity in four steps, I suppose. Really, really slowly, right? Uh, so the first step is that we want constructors. So I'm gonna want to give a, a thing zero and a unary operation. The unary successor, the unary operation should be injective and it should never yield zero. Um, the easiest way to achieve that is with Zamello's definition, right? So that the important thing about this definition is that it achieves these two properties. That's the first step. So far, we haven't even mentioned natural numbers at all. Uh, the second step is to say that a set is not inductive when it contains zero and it's closed under successor. The third step is to say that a set of all natural numbers is a minimal and therefore least not inductive step. By the way, at the moment, I'm assuming some version of set theory without the axiom of infinity, obviously. So I'm not assuming the axiom of infinity, but I am assuming the rest. Um, and finally, the axiom of infinity, well, the axiom of infinity says that there is a set of all natural numbers. I, want, I like to prefer to use that version because it uniquely specifies a set. I know a lot of authors will just say there is a nat inductive set, 
but that I, that I, like, I like that less because it doesn't uniquely specify a set. Uh, if you haven't seen an, an, any natural numbers before, here's an example of one. Okay, so that's the axiom of infinity. As I said, there's lots of other ways of presenting it, but that's the style that we're going to adopt as we move into our other axioms of infinity, other principles of infinity. So next on the list is signature infinity. So a signature is technically just a family of sets. So you have a set of symbols and um, each symbol has an arity, which is a set. Okay, that's what a signature is. And what does it mean for a set to be S inductive? It means that for any symbol I, little i and any tuple of things in X, you can put them together to get the ordered pair of the symbol and the elements of X, and that gives you a new element. Um, so a set of all S terms is what? It's a minimal and therefore least S inductive set. Um, so signature infinity is the principle that says for every signature, there's a set of all S terms. Um, this is a theorem of IZF, but if you go all the way down to CZF, you need to adopt it as an axiom because it doesn't follow from other things. But in ZF, you can prove it. In IZF, you can prove it. Uh, also, um, I've seen this under the name smallness of W types uh, in some, I know uh, in, that's what Benno Vandenberg calls it in one of his papers, this principle. Okay, uh, W types is a terminology from type theory. Uh, let's have an example of an S term. So here's a signature, four symbols. Each symbol has an arity. Two of them are nullary and- Wait, so you had no fun in this assumption on those sets KI, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, these sets are not correct. That's correct. Okay, but um, in all of your illustrations, they're gonna be small. That's right. My examples are very uh, noddy examples where everything is finite tree, but the principles do not have any finiteness assumptions um, because it's quite difficult to draw infinitely many infinite things. And so therefore I've checked- Especially online. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> makes, had, makes these things harder. Yeah. Um, so here's an so for this signature, here's an example of a term. You see, I put the symbols in red, and there's a right six and seven are accompanied by empty tuples, and five is accompanied by a four tuple, and eight is accompanied by a triple. Okay. Um, now, usually when we talk about S terms, we display them visually. So the picture on the right is the visual depiction of the set theoretic thing on the left. Wait, wait, so okay, now I remember why I asked that, because if these sets are, I mean, is there an implied linear ordering of these? Is it sets or sequences when you're, you're building your syntax? If I'm thinking of these as like parse trees, right? The order of the symbols might matter. No, these are sets. There's no ordering either on the set I or on the set KI. They're not ordered sets, they're just sets. Okay, it just happens that in the displayed examples they are. Yeah, I chose. Yeah, the okay. examples that I've chosen are very special. Correct. Um, okay. So yeah, there's no okay. ordering vertically or yeah. Um, so I'm using for my display on the right. I've chosen to use the vertical dimension for toppling, the horizontal dimension for internal structure, and I've chosen to put the root at the left. More commonly in papers, you will see the root at the top and the horizontal dimension for top of it. What I actually would prefer, but I can't really draw it, is rotate this, take this picture and rotate it into the depth dimension so that the root is at the front and the depth dimension is internal structure and the vertical dimension is for toppling. So if you could do that mentally, that would be helpful. Okay, but that's, so that's how we think of S terms. So now we know what signature infinity is. Before we move on, I want to give you some propaganda. Why should we believe in, right, this is okay, because there's some, this talk, okay, there's some maths, but there's also some pro philosophical propaganda. Why should we believe in the principle of S, the principle of S signature infinity? Well, I mean, as I said, you can actually deduce it from other principles, but um, at least some set theories, that's not the case. So I want to give you kind of direct, kind of direct thoughts. When you think about an S term, when you're building an S term, you take a symbol and a tuple of specified size, specified size, right? Um, the size is specified. So the kind of, it's a kind of 
definite concept because everything is prescribed. By contrast, when you build an ordinal, you're taking any set of ordinals, however big that set might be. So you don't have any kind of bound and intuitively that's open-ended. So obviously this is not math, this is just sales pitch, but intuitively the set, we, we have a set of S terms because it's kind of definite, it's prescribed, you've, given, you've said what, exactly what you're looking for. Whereas for an ordinal, we can't assume that because that it's a set. In fact, we can prove it's not a set, but that's another thing. Um, because it's kind of, the definition is open-ended. We can take any set of any size. Again, this is just sales pitch, but I'm gonna, gonna come back to this. Right, now we're ready for the first step beyond what we can do in ZFC. Right. This is reduced broad infinity. So once again, we're going to start off by needing some constructors. So I want to have a constant and a binary operation on the universe, right? Um, a make is going to be an injective binary operation and it should never yield begin. The easiest way to achieve that is set begin to be the empty set and the make uh, is the Kuratowski formula. Okay, that'll do. Um, and then I'm going to say that a reduced broad signature is a function from the class of all things to the class of all sets, right? It takes each thing in the universe to a set, which is called the arity of that thing. So everything in the universe has an arity. That's what a reduced broad signature does. Okay, so let's say we have a reduced broad signature. So what does it mean for a set to be inductive now? Well, first of all, begin, is contained in it. And secondly, if I have a thing in the set and a tuple of things in the set of the appropriate size given by the original thing, then we can put these together using make and get a new thing. Okay, so that's how, that's the closure property that we require. And then once again, as you've heard many times already, a set of all F broad numbers is a minimal and therefore least F inductive set. And the axiom scheme of reduced broad infinity says that for every reduced broad signature F, there's a set of all F broad numbers. Okay, so now you've seen the axiom scheme of reduced broad infinity, which as I said- What was reduced again? I, I, I missed, I lost reduced, I guess why I was- Oh, I call it, okay, reduced because it's, a, it's kind of a bit more special than the full axiom scheme of broad infinity, which I'm gonna to come to next. So I'm kind of starting with a baby version and then I'll come to the full version. Okay, I'm trying okay, to- Okay, and what makes this is a scheme is that you're, 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 you're quantifying overall signatures, so to speak. Right, right? and you a signature to... is a class function. Right, okay, fine. So therefore this is a scheme. Yeah, oh, you did say, yeah. Right, no, that's, keep, keep asking the questions because I'm sure you know, it helps to slow me down and gives people a chance to absorb these concepts. Um, right, so here's a preliminary fact. So we can easily show that there's a, a least F inductive class. So we have a class of all F broad numbers. So that's a starting point. Um, this actually is an example of what I call an introspectively generated class. That's because to test whether something belongs to, a, to, belongs to this class, you're just going to look at all of the epsilon descendants of X, and that's going to give you that information. And there are many examples of such classes, for example, the class of ordinals. Um, in the paper, by the way, there's an archive paper yeah, uh, with the same title as this talk, so you can look at that. For, uh, I'm, um, encourage, I encourage you to look at that. Um, so we can form a class. So a different, slightly different way of stating this axiom scheme is to say for any F, this class is a set, right? So you might prefer to say it that way or you might prefer the other way, whichever, whichever way you prefer, they're equivalent. Okay, let me give you an example to, of, a broad, of a broad number. So let's take, this is our signature, right? This is our reduced broad signature. Um, this broad signature, the, remember we have to give an arity to everything in the universe. And in, all my, in this example, remember all my examples are baby examples, right? So pretty much everything in the universe is nullary with one exception, which is binary. Okay, so therefore, begin is a broad number. We can use make to put begin together with the empty tuple. 
right? Because begin is nullary, therefore you pair it with the empty tuple. But once we've got this thing, this thing here is binary. So we pair it with a, uh, a, a two tuple of, um, of, of reduced broad number, of, of broad numbers, right? And then I've paired it again with the empty tuple. So that's an example of a broad number. Again, baby example. Okay, so looking at this example, if I want to draw this as a tree, again, it's well-founded, it's a three-dimensional tree. So the way I would like you to think about it is that we're using the vertical dimension for toppling. Make, remember, is a binary operation. So let's use the horizontal dimension for that and the depth dimension for the internal structure. You can't see me moving my stylus towards my face. There we go. The depth dimension for internal structure. Um, the root appears at the front and all of the leaves, which are marked as begin, appear at the rear. So that's what, how you should think of a broad number, right? As a three-dimensional tree. Um, okay, it's time for some propaganda again. So the first part of this propaganda, if you remember, was just the same as before. I tried to persuade you that S terms should form a set because when we build up an S term, we have simply uh, a symbol and a tuple of specified size. By the same intuition, the broad numbers form a set because what is a broad number? Well, either it's begin or we take a broad number and a tuple of broad numbers of specified size. That tuple has a specified size, fx, right? Given to us by our reduced broad signature. So is that definite? Well, I think that that is definite. And that's why intuitively, I think that this thing should be considered a set, right? So this is the case. It can only be a philosophical case. I can't prove it mathematically, but this is the case for saying that this thing is a set and that we should adopt this axiom scheme based on intuition. Um, okay, if you want to be skeptical about this, then one thing you might point to is the fact that when we have a, 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 um, a broad number, the justification of, of each part is coming from two directions, right? You've got the justification coming from the left um, and you've got the justification of all, right? I mean, probably easier to see here. You've got, you've got X and you've got these AKs. The X is, appears on the left and AK appears to the rear. So you've got this interplay of two kinds of justification coming from the left and coming from the rear. Yeah, so, so that might make you a bit uncomfortable, but I think that this is, it, it's reasonable to say that this is definite. I, intuitively, it seems to me that this is definite and that's why I want to advocate that we should accept this axiom scheme. Um, okay, that's reduced broad infinity. So the last part of this story, I think that's actually the biggest step, right? The step from reduced broad infinity to broad infinity is not very big. So this time for broad infinity, we need, again, we need constructors, but this time we want a ternary constructor. So build should be an injective ternary function of the universe and it should not yield start. And therefore, I'm a, and to achieve that, I'm, achieving, I'm, uh, I'm adopting these definitions, which is pretty much what you would expect. And I'm going to define a broad signature to be a function from the universe to the class of signatures. Remember, a signature is a family of sets. Okay, so it sends every X to a signature. So it's a little bit more complicated than a reduced broad signature. Wait, so what get... exactly are you are you interpreting this in standard set theory now? I, I'm just this step yes. conceptually. You did it before, yes. and I didn't think to ask. You're saying yes. you can implement these constructors in the following way, right? Oh, yes, yes. These are my yes. This is my def These are definitions, right? This works in any of the set theories I mentioned. This is how I define start and build. Yes, sure. Does that answer your question? I'm not sure. Okay, I don't, I don't really understand what your question is. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, I see. So this is. Oh, I see. So um, you you, you want to state your scheme, but the scheme is stated in terms of these as primitives, exactly. and, and and you need to to cash these out. What yeah. these primitives just, actually just mean? Just like. Just like in the axiom of infinity, um, 
right? I, my scheme was defined in terms of zero and successor. So I first of all needed to define zero and successor. Yes, yeah. Right, so there's no, it's the same. You're right, you're right, you're right. You're right, and you could have written the equivalent of X and infinity specifying a different, yeah, sure. I could have Nobody chosen does, a different implementation. So, yeah. this, this is just a convenient uh, implementation. Got it. And it also doesn't depend on- Also, the uh, word broad, does that just refer to the fact that your terms are not sort of, you know, linear at the- you know, they, Right, because if you, think of, if you think of natural numbers, right? If we go back to our example of a natural number, it just, they just, if I think of the root at the front, it's just going successor, 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 zero. Right, right. So it's kind of narrow, right? Yeah. These are broad because they're branching out. Yeah. 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 But as you said, there's no ordering. They're more like they have they're like they're like clusters and yeah, clusters. Yeah, and... that's that. Yeah, that's the thing about physical intuition is that space is ordered. But right. so you have there's to. There's probably uh, a good word somewhere, but anyway, like tassels okay. upon tassels. And... Okay, I had I had to use some word. Uh, I used broad, right? Um, <coughs> so where are we? That's reduced. We're on to we're going from. We're going to the next step, which is full broad infinity. So what's the rule here? So remember, G is a broad signature. So remember, that's a function from the universe to signatures. So what do we want? So for a set to be G inductive, we want start to be in. And we want to say, given a, an element so of the set, which gives, of course, gives us a signature and a symbol and a tuple, we can put them together. Remember, build is ternary. So we have the thing, one of the appropriate symbols chosen from a set, and then, uh, then a tuple indexed by a set, and that gives us our new broad number, right? So that's the construction process, if you like. Um, so what's a set of all G broad numbers? It's a minimal and therefore least G inductive set. And the axiom scheme of broad infinity says that these things always exist, right? Um, now, how does this compare to reduced broad infinity? So first of all, broad infinity implies reduced broad infinity. So they are actually equivalent, assuming excluded middle. But if, but once, but in, so in ZF or ZFC, they're equivalent. But if you're on the left side of that spectrum, then um, it might be that broad infinity is stronger. I mean, I, I, don't, I, can't, I don't know this for sure, but it could be. Um, so therefore the question arises for these people about how those two relate. And I would say that although broad infinity is a little bit more complicated because you've got three things and not two, I think it's pretty much the same intuition. So I would suggest that even if you are one of the people who don't accept excluded middle, strangers that may seem to some of the people here, uh, if you all belong to this community, I think if you accept reduced broad infinity, you're gonna be happy also with broad infinity, right? So I missed it again, reduced versus not. I somehow miss it right. every time. Right, right, right. Let's First time back. you said you hadn't made, it, made the point yet. Okay, here. Yeah. So, so there's a signature broad, versus a broad signature. Yeah, so look at when you've got broad infinity, you have a broad number x, and then, and that gives rise, given from the broad signature, that gives you a whole signature. And then you choose a symbol from that signature, and then you take a tuple of the appropriate size of broad numbers, right? So it's broad number, symbol, broad no tuple of broad numbers. That's how you build up a broad number for a broad signature. But if you only have a reduced broad signature, you, that's like you only have a single operation, a single symbol. Each, right? If, imagine that you take your reduced broad signature and you turn that into a signature because any set gives rise to a signature with just one symbol, right? Of that arity. So the set of size two gives rise to a signature with a single binary symbol. Mm -hmm. um, so that means that every reduced broad signature gives you a broad signature. Um, and then um, you, um, so intuitively reduced is a special case. I mean, that's, that's not quite a proof that, re that broad infinity implies reduced broad infinity because you have to be really careful with the constructors 
we're using, you know, I, I mean, there's a subtlety. But no, that was fine. I mean, if reduced, I mean, it doesn't matter to me exactly it just what it means. means. If it means something it, like, for example, you only have a certain number of binary yeah. operations. And it means you just have the simple, the simple way to think about it is reduced means that you only have signatures with a, a single, with just one sing symbol, right? So this. Just one symbol. Yeah. So this set oh. I, big I, is singleton. So therefore, your signature is just given by a set, which is the arity of that symbol. So therefore, when you give your triple, the middle component is kind of redundant because there's only one thing it can be. So you just have a pair instead of a triple. OK. OK. But um, so, right. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that anybody who accepts reduced broad infinity, even if they don't accept excluded middle, uh, although I'm per personally, I'm perfectly happy even with axiom of choice, let alone excluded middle, but even if they don't, they're going to accept broad infinity. Right. So, okay, before we move on, we've now finished our four principles of infinity, and I've kind of completed the sales pitch. Hopefully, I've persuaded you to believe the axiom scheme of broad infinity. Um, and before carrying on, I'll just have a literary interlude. So this is a quotation from Noel Coward that I learned from my mum when I was little. Um, I look at the changing sea and sky and try to picture infinity. The 2021 version of this is, I look at all the three-dimensional trees outside and picture and successfully picture broad infinity. Okay, so hopefully we've all um, got, we're all on board and we've all bought this thing that I've tried to sell to you. Now I can carry on with the consequences. So I really, I mean, I know this is very old fashioned, but I like to say, think that we accept um, or adopt axioms because they're intrinsically plausible, not because of their cool consequences. But now that we've bought the intrinsic plausibility, we can move on to the cool consequences. Um, so, um, well, I think, okay, I'm, I'm gonna, we're only about halfway through the talk, but hopefully, well, we'll see how we go. Um, so, the, the main consequences are to do with generating sets and families. And the way I think about it is we have a class C, we can talk about generating a subset of C or a family within C, an indexed family within C. And they can be generated by either a rubric or a broad rubric. And I'm gonna explain what I mean by those things. So again, my examples are all baby examples, right? So I'm gonna give you an example of a rubric on the natural numbers. So here's a simple idea. Um, we have a rubric tells me what's acceptable. So we have two rules, uh, rule zero and rule one. Rule zero is a binary rule. It takes two numbers, M0 and M1, to an, a family of numbers. And rule one is nullary, and it gives you this family of numbers. So the way to read this is as follows. If M0 is acceptable and M1 is acceptable, then for any P greater than or equal to two M0, the number M0 plus M1 plus M plus P is acceptable. And secondly, for any P greater than or equal to 50, 2P is acceptable. Once you know those things, you can immediately see that 100 is acceptable, right, from this rule. You can see that 102 is acceptable from this rule. And you can see that 402 is acceptable for two different reasons. Um, on the other hand, by induction, everything which is acceptable is at least 100. Therefore, 7 is not acceptable. Furthermore, so that, okay, hopefully that intuition makes sense. These are just rules. It's inductively defined subset of natural numbers. That's all it is. Um, and furthermore, I can write out a derivation for each of these things. So I've written out here a derivation for 100, which the thing in red identifies the rule. And the thing in blue identifies P, the subscript. Okay, so we take one, rule one, we take the empty tuple and we take P equals 50 and we get 100. In the case of 402, there are two different derivations. So the point is that sometimes a an element 
of the class can have more than one derivation. Okay, let's be now give the general definition. If we've got a class C, a rule consists of a set, which we call the arity, and a function that takes any k tuple to a family. Um, and um, if we didn't care about derivations, if we just said about acceptability, I could change this definition. So we just, I could use sets here instead of families. But because I care about derivations, I want to make this family. Um, what is a rubric? A rubric is simply a family of rules indexed by a set. Okay. Um, so when we have a rubric, we can talk about the set generated by that rubric. And what does that mean? It means a minimal, therefore least subset that is inductive. And what does inductive mean? It means that for any index of a rule and any tuple of things, elements of the set, um, look at the family of things that you get and choose an index and that gives you another IP, another element, right? So that's, in other words, it's closed under a subset. Inductive means it's closed under all of the rules. And intuitively, right, a minimal, the minimal, the set generated by R is consists of all of the elements which are obtained by applying the rules. That's the intuition. But the definition is that it's the minimal, a minimal set which is which satisfies, which is closed under the rules. That's the set generated. We can also talk about the family generated. So the family generated, this, is, this idea is supposed to capture um, the family. So we have, oh no, ah, I've written it, hang on, I don't need to write it out, it's already, it's already here. So we have a family and we think of that family, we think of big M as being the set of derivations and each M index an element. So the difference is when we generate a set, we're just looking at things which are derivable and we don't care how they were derived. But when we generate a family, we include the derivation with it. And then we can give a formal de definition, but basically we're just saying for any index and for any family of derivations, we can build up a derivation and then we get the element. Okay, so that's generation of sets, generation of family. Okay, so I told you what a rubric is. What about a broad rubric? Broad rubric is more liberal because you don't just have this family of rules, but you have something more. Once you've accepted an element, it triggers another rubric. So here's an example of a broad rubric on set of natural numbers. Um, so you see the basic rubric is the same as before. That's not changed. But seven triggers another rubric and a hundred triggers another rubric. So this means, for example, that once you know that a hundred is acceptable, then for any acceptable numbers M0, M1 and M2 and any P greater or equal to 17, M0 plus M1, M2 plus P is acceptable. So, so any rule, any acceptable element triggers a whole load of another, another load of rules, right? So that's what a broad rubric is. And um, so if you take this example, then we have a derivation of 100. So 100 is now, 102 are acceptable just as before, but now 107 is acceptable because, uh, why is that? Well, we said, right, it's, 107 is acceptable because 100 is acceptable and 102 is acceptable and rule one. Uh, hang on. I may have made a mistake here. Ah, uh, okay. I think there may be a mistake in this slide. I need to check that, sorry about that. Um, um, Maybe this is correct, maybe not, don't know. Anyway, I hope you get the idea, um, but seven is not accepted. So it's a more gen liberal way of giving a set of rules. Um, so generally speaking, what is a broad rubric? It consists of a basic rubric and then a collection of triggered rubrics, right? Each element of the class triggers another rubric. Uh, those of you that are sensitive to such things may start to wonder that I've got you know, functions, delivering classes and so on. But if you rearrange everything carefully in a suitable way, you can see that a, a rubric is a class 
and the broad rubric as a class. I mean, the paper I, in the paper I explained is you, you need to rearrange things a little bit to, to see that, but um, the way that I presented is more intuitive in this, so when I said, when I defined, so I'm saying that a rubric is a broad rubric includes a function. So I'm saying that, you know, uh, we have a function from C to rubrics over C and you might feel, oh dear, that's a collection of classes. What on earth is he talking about? But you can rearrange this and get a class. So it's not a problem. So again, just like before, we can say, what is a set generated by B? Well, you take a minimal set, which is inductive, which means that it's closed under all the rules. And once you have an element in X, then it's closed under all the extra rules that, you know, that are triggered by that element. The same for the family. I mean, if I wrote out all the rules, it's a bit painful, but hopefully you see the idea. We build up the derivations using, some of them are basic and some of them are triggered, right? So now, hope we can understand these four generation principles. Ge set generation says that every rubric generates a set, every rubric generates a family, every broad rubric generates a set, and every broad rubric generates a family. These are the four generation principles. They play a big role in this story. So let's go through some preliminary questions. So before you ask whether things generate a set, a reasonable question to ask is, do they even generate a class? Like, is there a minimal, therefore least, inductive class? Uh, that's a tricky question, and the answer, it depends on, in uh, roughly speaking, the answer is yes in ZF, and also in ZF, these other versions of ZF. It's not true, it, it's also true in the more constructive versions, but only with collection, which, and I don't really, collection is really not part of this story. So I would roughly say no in general, for at least some of the theories that I'm interested in, the answer Wait, is So no. the issue, I mean, for you, a class is just means, means it's definable? Yeah, can we construct a class, correct, that has the, is that, right, because when we talk about, ex remember I said before, when we talk about existence of a class, when we ask that, when we prove, when we have, so I have some meta theorems, like this yeah. one, that, when I said that this, that there's a- You actually class. have to display a class. You exactly. have to say, here's a to... formula and here it yeah. is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So when I said that, um, th that there's a class of broad numbers, F broad numbers, I meant that we can construct the class, right? We can no, but I guess what I'm wondering is when you ask like, does every rubric generate a class? I mean, Okay. I mean, is it there seems, a way? I mean, I, was, I mean, it seems to me that by virtue of you having gone through several slides and talking about what rubrics do for you, how could it not? Can't you turn that into a? Can't you turn that into a ZF defin a language okay. of set theory definition if, of something? If you were in impredicative class theory like Kelly Morse, then the the answer would trivially be yes. Oh, right? I'm using a neat power set. You're saying you 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 will be saying take those elements that belong to every inductive class. That would be acceptable in Kelly Morse, but we're not in Kelly Morse. So the if we for, uh, we can only construct classes, right? And um, in right. some of these oh, areas, I see. Okay. we can okay. construct such a class. But in some of them, I don't know how to construct such a class. However, it, the second question is, does every broad rubric generate a large family? By large family, I mean, it's like a, fa a family is indexed by a set, but a large family is indexed by a class. So yes, in all of these cases, we generate, a broad rubric does generate a large family and these are introspectively generated, but it's more complicated. So we need, in the paper, you'll see the whole procedure for introspective generation of large families. Um, and so because of this fact, we can express broad family generation by saying for any broad rubric, the large family that it generates is actually a family. You know, the indexing, this big M is actually a set. Um, okay, that's a preliminary question, but we're really interested in the sets and the families. So here's the lowdown. Uh, so family generation is provable. So that's true in, in ZF. Right, in, true in all of even in the, even in these really weak theories like CZF, right? Um, using signature infinity, um, every rubric generates a family. But if we once we assume choice, every rubric generates a set. 
Um, and again, without choice, we can prove that broad infinity is equivalent to broad family generation. But with choice, we can go a step further and get broad set generation. Let me try to give now, let me try to give you an intuition. This is think of this as ZF, right? Or ZFC, right? So in ZFC, if we have a, a rubric and that give we know that gives us a family, right? So this is the family. How are we going to get the generated set? Well, obviously, we're just going to take the, the, the range. I mean, intuitively, big M is the set of derivations, and XM is the thing that's derived by the derivation little m. So if we want to take the set of all derivable elements, that's just that's this. And we want to show that that's the set generated. The problem is to show that that is actually minimal. So. So no, the minimality is easy actually. So is it R inductive? Is it closed under the rules? That's the question. Well, if we're given I and I and we're given a tuple of derivable elements, we choose using axiom of choice a derivation for each of them and then we build up a bigger derivation. So this is where we use axiom of choice. Um, Actually, we can get away with a weak form of axiom of choice. Um, and I, some of you may be familiar with this, which is WISC, um, but we have to be a bit careful. So uh, there's a concept of a cover for a set, and there's a WISC axiom saying that every set has a weakly initial set of covers. Um, and if we assume that, ev that we have a global function that, so not just the existence, um, but we assume we have a global function, then that's enough to get us to what we want. So for the non-broad case, we can get away with WISC or something a little bit stronger, but for, but for the broad version, we need this global function, or I just said we need, we, it suffices to assume this global function. And I, I don't know how to do it with less. Um, right, so we can get away with a weak form of choice. Okay. Before I fin so I've introduced these generation principles, and I want to give you two applications to see how you would use the generation principles. So one example is Grothendieck universes. So Grothendieck universe, given the set X, what is a Grothendieck universe extending X? It's a set, a transitive set, um, with the property that first of all it's a superset of X, and I'm going to take, okay, you so. I'm going to suppose that it contains the set of natural numbers and it contains the union set and power set and also the range of any tuple. Um, now, if we have broad set generation, then we see that every set generates a growth and deep universe. So in other words, there's a minimal there for, for any set X, there's a minimal there for least growth and deep universe that contains it. Why? Well, we have to form a broad rubric. So we're going to have a constant for every element of X. And these things are all going to be given. This part is all given by the basic rubric. And then this part, you see the set X, so the set K, once that is in, once we've accepted that K is in, then that triggers another rule whose arity is K. So immediately, the set, the broad set generation tells us that we have growth of the universes. I mean, I'm sure you've all seen a different story where we take, or many of you will have seen, you know, starting with Ordis Marlowe and deducing uh, inaccessible cardinals and using that to deduce growth. But here we could, get, but the point is we go straight from broad set generation. It's immediately, once you know broad set generation, you immediately see that growth of the universes are generated. And okay, so your, your last condition there is what you might call your sort of second order replacement that rounds it out as a growth. Exactly, exactly. You couldn't do this with a rubric because of this last condition. You need a broad rubric to get this to work. Okay, um, and the reason it's got to be broad is because of this last condition, which is often called second order replacement. Yeah. Um, what part of it's broad? Is it the arbitrary, the arbitrariness of the within you? Is that it could? Is that is it that that's it's the, the only... fact? Broad, going back to the definition of broad rubric. So Which remember, I, I broad just never rubric. Never seem to get. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. It's fine. It's always good to slow me down because I always go too fast. I mean, I'm, now um, I'm triggered. 
have triggered. Right, exactly. Once you've got an element, so you've got a collection of basic rules. Remember, a rubric is a, collect, is a set of rules, a family of rules indexed by a set. But so that's your, you've got your, all your basic rules. But then on top of that, every time you get an element that triggers some more rules. In this example, it triggers one more rule. But uh, in the in the in the Grothendieck example, it triggers. What one is rule. C? Oh, oh, oh! C is the the class that we're working within. The so class that case, you're working. It would yeah. just be the in this particular example of Grothendieck universes. It would be um, the universe. It would be C would be just the whole universe. So for each thing in the universe, if in this example, you know, if it's a set, then it triggers that example. And if it's not a set, well, it just triggers the empty rubric. I can. What I just said was very classical, but I can make it intuitionistic with a bit more work. Um, right. I mean, we're, we're, right. Okay. By the way, in these intuitionistic theories, we can't even assume that everything is either a set or not a set. So um, that's a side remark. Not that, not that it causes us any problems. We can get, we can still live. So. Okay, that's my first illustration. So that's an illustration of broad set generation. I want to give you an illustration of broad family generation, which I don't know if it will be familiar to people here, but it's certainly familiar to everybody who works in Martin Lerf type theory, where they, they talk about Tarski style universes. By the way, the connection to Tarski is pretty tenuous. But um, anyway, I uh, so. What is a Tarski style unit? It's, like, it's a bit like a Grothendieck universe, but it's a family. It's a family of sets. And again, we, I'm going to assume, ah, let's go back to that. I'm going to assume that we start with a family of sets and we want to extend it. And we're going to have some constructors here, like embed and zero and pi. These are all constructors. I could define them, uh, but I'm not going to bother. So uh, they're just constructors. So if we have um, anything in A, then we have a corresponding thing in in this bigger un in this bigger universe, which is basically the same set. The important bullet we have we have something corresponding to the empty set, and so on. The important rule is this one: if I have um, a code, these things in in type theorists call these things M codes. M is a set of codes. And they would call these things types, and um, let me carry on underneath uh, and and uh, B A is the type coded by A. This is the what you will hear if you read type theory papers, right? Um, so um, so we have a code of a type, and then we have um, a collect an in fact, if you like, a family of codes. And we put them together to get the product type, which is this thing, but it's again, it has a code. So this is, they do this all the time. They have these, these, these Tarski style universes. And for this, to show that, this that every family of sets generates a Tarski style universe, we don't need broad set generation. It suffices to have broad family generation. And if you remember, this is the thing that we don't need axiom of choice to prove. We do need broad infinite, well, so. Let's say that we do need broad infinity, but we don't need axiom of choice. Okay, to prove this. Whereas the previous one is broad set generation, which. Uh, oh, sugar. Broad set generation relies on AC. So Grothendieck universes relied on AC. Tarski style universes don't rely on AC. Okay, so. We're done, with, we're done with generation principles. We've seen our four generation principles, right? We've seen that they, the, the set generation ones require or use axiom of choice, actually a weak form of choice suffices. And we now see the power of broad infinity. It makes it really easy to show that these sets exist. Well, what's, well it implies set generate broad. Once we've got broad set generation, it makes it easy to show that these sets exist. Okay, so far I have not mentioned ordinals, right? Uh, and don't get me wrong, I love ordinals, but I think that for this, uh, um, I, I'm, I'm trying to downplay them in this talk. Now we're ready to talk about ordinals. Um, uh, I'm, yeah, okay. If, 
uh, it's really well unless the chair tells me to hurry up i'm just going to carry on at this pace i think it's a uh, um so um so here's some background so this is something that some of you will be familiar with i learned this from from Adrian, last time I gave this talk, he told me about this, and also from Asaf uh, Karagila. Um, so um, there are Hartog's numbers and there are Lindenbaum numbers. So the idea of a Lindenbaum number, which is called Aleph star, um, this is the set of order types of well-ordered partial partitions. That partial partition basically means equivalence relations on subsets. And the properties, this is in, this thing re relies on power set, right? So this is good for ZF or good for IZF, but it's not going to work if you're in the CZF world because, um, so there you have to be more careful, but I, we can do a version of things with CZF, but uh, you have to be more careful. In the, in the ZFC, you wouldn't bother with all this because it's completely unnecessary. Anyway, um, so what do we know? We have some properties of these. There are various properties of this number. Okay, so this is a number or an order type. You're being a little, you're being okay, it, sorry, fast it's a and set loose of, here. So. Yeah, you're right, you're right. It's a set of order types. If you think about it, it's a lower set. Of, so order types are ordinals. So it's a set of ordinals. And it's furthermore, if you think, you'll see that it's a lower set of ordinals. Therefore, it's a transitive set of ordinals, mm -hmm. which is an ordinal. Therefore, we get an ordinal. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. For okay. So it's transitive. It's lower. Therefore, transitive, i.e., an ordinal. Um, but I'm just saying the when you when, when the the ordering on order types is what just 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 include just order uh, types refinement are, order types are ordinals um, and so it's the usual ordering on ordinals which is um, elem, uh, or the class of okay if if we want no to but you don't say ordinals you say well ordered partial partitions so right, I'm trying to figure it, right. out what, so that's a well ordered set every well ordered set has an order type which is an ordinal yeah okay. So therefore, we have a set of ordinals. Is that, is that okay? Okay, I guess I just don't know what a well-ordered partial partition is. Okay, I mean, well, well, okay, let me well slow Well-ordered refers to something, and I'm not sure what, right. but I go okay. on. Okay, um, think partial partition means, if you like, equivalence relation on subset, okay? Yes. Or if you prefer, it's a collection of subsets, which is which are pairwise disjoint, but don't necessarily sure. cover the whole set. And then you take all of those and... I suppose it's well ordered. So you've got, in addition, you've got a well ordering on it. On the, on the carrier property. set of the yeah, whole on thing? The, on the quotient. It, on the quotient. No, on the quotient. Okay, yeah. on the quotient. Okay. Right. Which is the, if you're thinking of the partial partition, which is the set, then it's on that set, which is the quotient, corresponds to the quotient. Okay. okay. Right. Then we, so that's a well ordered set. It has an order type, which is an ordinal. Um, and there are own, because of the power set axiom, there are only set many partial partitions of A. So there are only set many well-ordered partial partitions of A. So we get a set of ordinals when we do this. Does that make sense? Okay. 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 So there, and because of this extra fact, it's an ordinal. So so the thing is that this these constructions, this along with the Hartog's construction, these are two different ways of converting a set into an ordinal. You know, if you live in the world of ZFC, well, every set has a cardinality, which is an order, has a cardinal, which is an ordinal, right? So it's really easy to move from a set to an ordinal. If you don't have choice, you can't do that, but you have these two different ways of moving from sets to ordinals. And there are relationships between them. And this is the one that's useful for us. Okay, now, this, I'm, I'm gonna say something which I haven't said previously, but it, it wouldn't surprise me if many of the people in the audience were thinking of this earlier in the talk. So here's what, when we take a rubric or a broad rubric, if we want to think about the generated set. One way to think about it, which is I think an obvious approach for people trained in set theory, is to, to, to construct it by transfinite recursion. So we take an increasing chain of subsets, but we start off with the empty set and 
at a successor ordinal, we apply, we look at all the different ways, we look at all the elements we have so far, and we apply all the rules available to us, and that gives us a bigger set. So we get an increasing chain of subsets uh, indexed by the ordinals. And when we come to limit ordinals, take the union. Um, this description is, of course, very classical because I'm assuming that every ordinal is zero or limit or successor. You, you have to present it slightly differently if, it's, if you're not classical, but that's easy to do, not a problem. Okay, so this is one way of trying to get these generated sets. Um, and furthermore, if you're lucky, this chain will stabilize and that gives us the set generated. And in fact, conversely, any if, it gener if the set generates then it, the set, then it stabilizes. So the question of generation is equivalent to the question of whether this increasing chain stabilizes. They're the, they're the same question. So now I've done what I say set theorists like to do, which is to reduce this question of generated sets to a question about ordinals. Okay, now remember that an ordinal is the same thing as a transitive set of ordinals. Um, so now, before I talked about Blass's axiom and orders Marlow, I want to talk to turn these, there's a different way of stating each of these, which is generation. So Blass generation, when I, what I mean by that is the statement that for any ordinal, that any ordinal generates a regular ordinal, okay? And uh, that's obviously equivalent to Blass's axiom. Equivalent, I'm, I'm assuming, this is the ZF world, right? This is all assuming, this equivalence, I'll say this, equivalent, this is all uh, using excluded middle, right? So some, some of these implications use excluded middle and some don't. And in the paper, it's all kind of laid out. All the, well, we'll come to, actually, you'll see us the pictures soon. Um, right. Uh, and that, so that's, this is obviously equivalent. And then now set generation gives us blast generation because I said that set generation is for any class. And we can take the class of ordinals and therefore we generate sets of ordinals, including, and an ordinal is a set of ordinals. So it's just a matter of finding the right rule and that's quite easy to do. So we can easily see that set generation implies blast generation. The converse is using Lindenbaum numbers. So if we, um, we have this property, if we have blast generation and we want to know that the transfinite chain stabilizes, then we just take the Lindenbaum numbers of the arities, basically that's it. And then we take the supremum of that and we can see that, uh, what did I say? Um, property two, uh, no, hang on. Yeah, that's right. If a rubric or broad rubric generates a set, then uh, no, 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 I'm talking about, hang on, sorry, go back, go back, go back. Um, I said that if you have an indexed family of order, right. Okay. I think generally speaking, uh, it's a, it will be a mistake for me to try to go into any proofs. Uh, I want to give you the high level story. So if you want to see the proofs, look at the paper. Okay. I think uh, I, I just want to wrap up soon. So um, I won't go into any proofs. So anyway, um, Marlowe's Prince, or does Marlowe, can also be expressed as a generation principle. And this is due to Jorgensen. It's quite an old formulation of Ordis Marlowe. And this says that given any ordinal function, it looks, it's very similar to Blast generation. Blast generation says that any ordinal give, generates a regular ordinal. Jorgensen generation says that any ordinal function generates, uh, um, generates uh, an ordinal, a regular ordinal. So what does that mean? There's a least regular ordinal uh, greater or equal to that function. What do I mean by an ordinal being greater than equal function? I mean that anything which is less than kappa is mapped to something which f of, which um, is less than or equal to kappa. So it's pretty obvious that this principle, for example, gives you um, inaccessible cardinals and that kind of thing. So um, I personally find Jorgensen generation much more intuitive than Ordis Marlowe. In my opinion. 
this is more intuitive than Odis Molo, but maybe you disagree. I found Odis Molo very confusing when I first saw it. And I probably was more intuitive for Jorgensen, but who knows. Okay, and it's also clearly very similar to blast generation. So we can then show that this is equivalent to broad set generation. So that's all I really want to say about ordinal, ordinals. And I now want to show you four pictures. Remember, so this is to wrap up. So um, I'm going to, I now want to, so we're coming to the end of the talk. Uh, I want to um, show you four pictures. One picture for the CZF school, one picture for the IZF school, one picture for the choiceless mathematics, the ZF school, and one picture for the ZFC school with axiom of choice. Um, the picture gets simpler and simpler as we move along. But all of these pictures are a square, so hopefully this is not too small. So we start with a base theory, and the base theory for CZF is not assuming truth value set, and I'm going to allow, as I said, I'm going to allow our elements and non-well-founded sets. It doesn't cause any problem. Um, in the base theory, we have signature infinity, uh, and we have family generation. Moving to the right, we're adding broad infinity, right? So we're adding broad infinity over here. Downwards, we're basically proving these things that you can get with axiom of choice or a little bit of choice. So moving down, we're adding a little bit of choice and that takes us to set generation and broad set generation, right? And we have a kind of spectrum of different principles here. Uh, you can read about them in the paper. I've taught V pure is the pure well-founded set. That's a little bit less than full set generation. Okay, when we have IZF, the story becomes a little bit simpler. We have power set. We can use this whole argument with um, Lindenbaum. Uh, and a lot of things come together, but we still have this picture. Okay, now we have choiceless mathematics. This is the world of ZF. So we have excluded middle now. We, ha ah. we have excluded middle. So this is... Uh, maybe more palatable to people like Gunter. Uh, so we have excluded middle, we have a square. So actually this is probably this is the picture that I want to push the most. Um, we start off with the base theory with Boolean truth, right? Which is the set equivalent to ZF with, but we allow atoms and non-well-founded sets. And moving to the right, we have broad infinity and reduced broad infinity, which are equivalent because we have excluded middle. Um, we have in these two things, we have family generation and broad family generation. Moving down, we have set generation and broad set generation. You see these, these are the ones which are equivalent, which give us Blass's axiom and Ordis Marlow. So I, I really want to say that we've separated the intuitions. This is how I think about it. Maybe you disagree, but this is how I think about it. We've separated the intuition of broad infinity from that little bit of choice that takes us to Ordis Marlow. And then finally, the final picture is mathematics with choice, where broad infinity and Ordis Marlow are equivalent. And similarly, Blass's axiom is already provable because we've got choice. Okay, so those are the four pictures. So it's time for some conclusions. And oh, it's half, I'm gonna say it's half seven. For you, it is some other time. Uh, sorry, how many hours? I can't remember, half four. Okay, if you're in New York. Right, um, so that's the time I was going. So to wrap up, here are the conclusions. So we have a new axiom scheme called broad infinity, uh, new in a certain sense. Hopefully you find it intuitive. Uh, maybe I should put some scare quotes here. Um, it's equivalent in all these theories, it's equivalent to broad family generation. That's a very strong result. Everybody, whatever school you belong to, you should accept it's equivalent to broad family generation. Um, if you accept some of these other principles like excluded middle, global WIS functions and axiom of choice, then it, it's equivalent to a lot of things, including Ordis Marlow if you're gonna accept axiom of choice. Um, everything that I've done works perfectly well if you have Ur elements and non-well-founded sets, that's entirely up to you. And the finally, the story for infinity and the story for broad infinity are 
somewhat analogous. I mean, not 100%, but mostly they're analogous. So that's the conclusion. Right, now I want to, okay, so now I'm gonna create a whole load of another, another load of um, discussions probably, now that we've wrapped up and um, the chair can breathe a sigh of relief that we've not gone too far over time. Now I wanna say some of the further lines of work. So one thing that I would really like, if somebody could come up with a broad version of Gittick's results. So if you could show that you could have ZF, broad ZF, right? This will be great. I wanna see a paper with this title. All, um, how does it go? All ordinals can be, how does it go? All ordinals can be singular in broad ZF. That would be a great paper. I would like to see that. That would really, uh, of course, it would be assuming some consistency hypothesis, but it would really establish that this square is genuinely a square. There's no kind of interaction between the two dimensions. Secondly, um, I mean, one of the motivations for this was the theory of induction recursion in type theory, which is quite closely related to broad family generation. Actually, I mean, I say this is future further work, but I really, I know the main relationship, but it, um, they have things called inductive recursive universes, and they are basically that you can show that these are equivalent to being closed under the broad family generation principle. Another thing is, are these principles true in models? Um, and there's some work of Michael Ratchum, which is, uh, I think is relevant to that, but to be honest, I'm really not sure. Another question is, what about this global WISC function? Is that available in models? I don't know the answer to any of these questions. Right, the thing that I've put in blue is really the whole, a whole nother issue, which is adding, once we accept broad infinity, a lot of certain philosophical problems with ZFC that, previ that were previously not very big problems and were generally swept under the carpet become much more acute. And that particularly the issue of unrestricted quantification and what that is supposed to mean. It becomes more acute when you have um, broad, broad infinity. Now, uh, this is a, would be a whole nother talk and subject, so I don't want to get into this. But um, but I've given this deliberately given this talk in familiar theories um, that are perfectly happy on the whole with unrestricted quantification. You could dip, dispute that for C Z F, but it's certainly true for Z F C and Z F and I Z F. They um, and I've deliberately done that because I want to present broad infinity in a setting that everyone is used to. Um, but Actually, because of this issue here, I doubt that broad ZFC is consistent. I um, personally don't believe that. Obviously, I don't have a Kazdri example. Um, so I'm in the funny um, situation of promoting an axiom scheme as being true, while at the same time doubting that adding it to ZFC is consistent. Um, but that's a completely Another thought. So I just I felt I had to make that disclaimer. That um, but um. So why why would you? I mean, can you elaborate on why you? I mean, I was just thinking about what the content is, and I mean, there's some. I guess there's a little bit of large cardinals content in this because it becomes equivalent to orders malo. But I mean, everyone seems to believe that. I mean, that that's like really tame. Like oh, you, you, know, you grown might, you, believe in you much might, bigger cardinals, okay. right? Well, so it's not that. I, you know, well, so I, where, I, mean, why, I mean, I mean, but so where is, I mean, what is it? I mean, is it, is it on okay. mathematics? Is it a particular what scares mathematical me? application okay. that you don't like? Let me say what scares me. Let me try and put it like yeah. this from one point of view, um, on terms of the consistency. So when well, you look, build... replacement scares me, but I mean... okay. Um, where, well, here's the thing because I accept broad infinity, I accept Roth and deep universes. And therefore, I'm happy that ZFC is consistent because I believe in the least Roth and deep universe, which is a model of ZFC, right? So that's why I believe in ZFC, because it's modeled by the least Roth and deep universe, which is implied by broad infinity. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to broad ZFC, um, you know, I could say, well, it's modeled by the least Mollo universe, but I have no reason to believe in that. And what, what bothers me is that. I tried to give you this intuition for why um, 
the set, why this set, why we should have this set of broad numbers, right? But this is whole, I said, this should hold for any broad signature. Now, a, that means we have to be given, the broad signature is the input to this principle. So it's something that we're given. We're assuming that we believe that we have for everything a set. But this broad signature could itself be quantifying over the involve. It's given by a formula, right? Because it's a scheme. So this broad signature is given by a formula. And this formula could qu quantify as over the entire universe, which includes the set of broad numbers that we're trying to construct. So potentially there's a circularity here. Now, um, the, I mean, I, like I say, I, I, I haven't proved in- right, So is, is, I mean, is orders, I, I should know this. Um, maybe you know this, right? Is orders Malo equivalent to the statement that that any set that you know that you have arbitrarily large Grotendieck universes rather than just one. No, I mean, I mean, more often stronger. than not, that's it's the stronger. better statement. That's the axiom of universes, right? That follows. I, so. I believe I believe in the axiom of universes because it's given to me by this broad infinity that I believe in. I have no problem with that, and and choice, of course. Um, but um, what, are you, what are you complaining about? Then I missed it. Orders Marlow is stronger. And so, so, oh, so, so Marlow is stronger than okay, yeah, than the axiom of universes, right? I so see. I have no problem with the consistency of axiom of universes, but Ordis Marlow or equivalent. Remember, these are equivalent. Broad infinity or Ordis Marlow, they're equivalent because I'm believing. I'll in have to look that up. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So I um, doubt the consistency because, uh, right? I I know that people in this community study much more much stronger principles, um, and obviously it's it's. Perfect. Oh, so you're that's what that's the that's the hill you're going to die on then like you you believe, okay so you believe you'll your position will be uh, that you'll you'll take arbitrarily large axiom uh, universes and you have some yep. some philosophical grounding for that maybe in your scheme but yep. but you don't feel that that gets you all the way to word is mallow correct that's because, an interesting place to put yourself right. okay so, good so that was the, so to 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 flesh this out, I would well. need to to flesh this out. I would need to present a completely different set theory, which would definitely we don't have time to since I have minus eight or even more minutes yeah. remaining of this talk. Um, but uh, so, but the the point is that I want to sell this axiom scheme first to you. Um, uh, without drawing your attention to the serious philosophical crisis that it's going to give rise to, which is um, which is like the next step in this story. Okay, um, right. So uh, yes. Okay. Oh, we've had so I haven't even now. I see some messages. Does prove orders Marlow implies broad infinity? The answer is yes, it does. To prove that direction doesn't require choice. Um, in fact, that should be clear from the slide. I don't know if Elliot, if, uh, who asked that question? Uh, I don't know if Elliot is still here. I can look, but uh, um, anyway. Uh, Oh, somebody is calling me, but I'm going to ignore them. Um, no, so I will have to tell him that the answer is yes anyway. So, and the last question was, you have to introspectively generate and have to leave there. Okay, so for the small number of people that remain, uh, thanks for listening, holding out. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, yeah, I just want to make sure, uh, are, uh, are there any other questions still Oh yeah, please, uh, please ask um, more questions. I'm quite happy to to discuss this for another three hours. You might. It uh, doesn't have to be three hours, but I just okay. want to make sure that anybody who has a question gets a chance to ask. Yeah. Um, yeah that's... Is there anybody? No? Okay. Seems like everybody is satisfied. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, I just want to uh, remind everybody that next Friday, the talk will start at 11 uh, New York City time. Uh, we have a speaker from Germany and uh, it works better for her at that time. Uh, Vika is going to send out uh, a, a reminder email for sure as usual. Okay, uh, thanks a lot and uh, see you next week. Sorry. Right. Okay.